Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out Napoleon Bonaparte, Crash Course European History, number 22. Hi, I'm John Green and this is Crash Course European History. So the word revolution is a funny one because it literally means a full turn of 360 degrees, like you end a revolution where you started out. But in history, revolution means radical change, stark departures from the world that was, and the messy, often violent, embrace of a new world. The French Revolution was, in different ways, both kinds of revolution. In the end, an absolutist government was replaced by an absolutist government. But the change that emerged from the revolution was real and lasting. It helped usher in a world where people saw themselves as citizens of a community rather than subjects of a king, and eventually a rising military star named Napoleon Bonaparte would prove that having your dad be king of France was not the only way to become <laughs> ruler of France. Yeah, I literally just moments ago watched a video about Napoleon's genius in warfare. And I guess this is going to tell us more about how he rose to power. Something that they said in the last video that was that he was not a control freak at first. He was very open to chaos on the battlefield, and he just ebbed and flowed with it and adapted to it. And that's how he won. And uh, the guy in the last video called him the Mozart of warfare. But then once he gained power, he became a control freak because he wanted to maintain power. And that was his downfall. He tried to control the chaos. You can't do that. It doesn't work. Napoleon grew up poor in Corsica, but he loved reading and managed to secure a scholarship to a military academy. As a kid, he spoke Corsican and Italian and didn't start learning French until he was 10, and he was bullied for his accented French and for his overall tininess, although despite what you may have heard about Napoleon complexes, Bonaparte would eventually end up being around 5 feet 7 inches tall. Course? I didn't know Corsica had its own language. French is Corsica's official and working language, although many Corsicans are bilingual or trilingual, speaking Italian and native Corsican language. Oh, Corsu. Wow, I've never heard of it. Are there any samples? I want to hear it. Oh, here we go. The Corsican language. Corsu. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Declaration Universal dei Diritti Umani. Nascono tutti l'uomo liberi e pari in dignità e diritti. Sodutati di ragione e di conscienza, e li tocca a agire tra di elle di modo vaderno. Wow, it sounds Italian, but slightly more German or French, I guess. So he had an accent. That's funny. And he was five foot seven. Got it. In the last video I saw, they said that one of the reasons that people think of Napoleon as being short is because he surrounded himself with really tall soldiers, the elite guard. And so he looked short in comparison. Five foot seven's not tall, though. He entered the army as a second lieutenant in 1785 and began to rise through the ranks throughout the tumultuous years of the French Revolution. By the time he was 24 in 1793, he was a brigadier general working under the Committee for Public Safety, 24. which, as you'll recall, killed a lot of the public in the name of public safety. And oh. then in 1798, <laughs> Wait, Napoleon what? killed... Committee for Public Safety. The Committee of Public Safety was created by the National Convention in 1793 with the intent to defend the nation against foreign and domestic enemies, as well as to oversee the new functions of the executive government. Members were elected and served for a period of one month. They killed the Herbertists and Dantonists. I'm probably saying that wrong. Herbertists. It's like calling the Patriot Act or the, the Freedom Act when it actually restricts freedom. And then in 1798, Napoleon crossed into Egypt with an entire army at his command, aiming to disrupt Britain's access to India. In addition to lots of oh. soldiers, Napoleon also brought with him scientists and linguists and other scholars to advance knowledge and also carry off Egyptian riches. Oh, the right. Egyptians were... Yeah, I've heard that he was the one that knocked off the nose of the Sphinx, but then that's just an urban legend, apparently. Right? The Egyptians were impressed by the openness of these scholars, but in general, the French completely appalled the local people with their crude ways and drunkenness. And even <laughs> as Napoleon flattered Egyptians by declaring himself a worshiper of Islam, he ultimately stole and desecrated many Egyptian artifacts. Although later he also stole and desecrated lots of artifacts from around Europe. Hmm. He loved a plundered artifact. At any rate, ultimately Napoleon had to return to France in 1799 as his army and navy were defeated by the British and the Egyptians. 
I could totally see him loving a plundered artifact. It's a trophy. It's a physical proof that you've kicked someone's dick in the dirt. At any rate, ultimately, Napoleon had to return to France in 1799 as his army and navy were defeated by the British and the Egyptians. And that timing turned out to be perfect. The Directory, which you'll recall was a five-person committee governing France after the collapse of Robespierre's Committee for Public Safety, was overseeing a still-floundering economy and fighting wars on many fronts. Napoleon helped overthrow the Directorate in 1799 and quickly became First Consul, and then took as his first task mending fences with the Catholic Church. Okay. He agreed to the Concordat of 1801, which recognized Catholicism as the primary French religion. So first consul, is that like essentially like a prime minister? <laughs> Not the first game console, no. All right, it's just telling me about Nintendo. He agreed to the Concordat of 1801, which recognized Catholicism as the primary French religion. It also validated the sale of church lands and the state's payment of clergymen's salaries if they swore to uphold the French government. And oh. that was important because it ensured him the support of one of France's most important institutions. And you'll recall our discussions about how even dictators need support from within their holdings. But it's also telling that Napoleon would eventually be excommunicated by the Catholic Church for annexing papal lands for France. Napoleon was hmm. also popular with the people. He offered a solution to decades of instability and economic decline. He won majorities when he had his candidacy for wow. Wow. and other decisions approved by plebiscite or vote cast by men over the age of 21. He was voted? Hang on, what? He won majorities when he and his candidacy for office and other decisions approved by a plebiscite or vote cast by men over the age of 21. Wow. I guess they needed him. In 1802, he had himself declared consul for life, and in 1804, there it is. emperor. <laughs> Did the center of the world just open up? Is there a bust of somebody who actually believes himself to be the center of the world in there? It is, it's Napoleon himself. Stan got this in Paris, I can tell because it says souvenir de Paris. So this bust of Napoleon, <laughs> complete with its armlessness and being cut off at the torso and everything, is extremely Roman-ish. And this was part of how Napoleon mm. justified his dictatorial form of government. He said, no, we're just going back to the Roman Empire, to the good old days of ancient Rome. And dictators do this a lot. From the Russian word czar, which comes from the word Caesar, to 20th century dictators oh, when your leaders start talking about reviving the glory of the Roman Empire. Get nervous. Oh, yeah. look, it's half French, half Roman Napoleon. So during the French Revolution, leaders promoted the ancient Roman idea of virtu, that is, the sacrifice of personal interest for the good of the Republic okay. or the whole. Napoleon continued all that Roman imagery, but switched it from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. You can even see this in his journey from being a consul to being an emperor. He was portrayed in lavish costume and crowned with the laurel leaves of a conquering hero empire style in furniture arose and women donned slim white dresses free from corsets and voluminous petticoats oh. in imitation of Roman statuary. Right. And Napoleon saw himself... Yeah, uh, the neoclassical movement was really big at the time, right? Where they would build buildings that look like ancient Roman buildings and the style became more simple and classical. And Napoleon saw himself as a modern Justinian, the famed ancient lawgiver. So to that end, he set out to have the most celebrated jurists under his guidance produce a rational code of laws. Completed in 1804, the Code Napoleon, aka the Napoleonic Code, standardized the laws of citizenship, family, and property. The code That's made rules thing. for financial transfers and mortgages and for other legal transactions concerning property standards across France instead of differing from province to province. And legal standardization facilitated modern economic development. But the other two sections on family and citizenship stunned many for the way they impoverished and curtailed most of the rights of women. Right. Under the Napoleonic Code, women had no right to their own property once they were married, not even wages they earned themselves. They could not serve as witnesses in court nor have control over or guardianship of their own children. They had to live where their husbands directed them to live. If they committed adultery, they were sent to jail, but men, in contrast, would only be charged with a crime if they brought a sexual partner into the family home. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Lest you think that history is simply a march toward more people having more rights, not always. Yeah, but by that's really surprising. I, I didn't know women had those rights before Napoleon. When did that happen? 
Who gave them those rights? 1791. Revolutionary France gives women equal inheritance rights, although they lose them later because of Napoleon. So they had it for just a few years, and then Napoleon yanked it away. Trying to control. Trying to control everybody. And a man could commit adultery as long as he didn't do it in the home. His family home. But by creating laws that specifically targeted the economy, the empire was seen as paving the way for modernization, and other institutions followed. Individual schools were founded for higher education in engineering, science, and technology, Smart. and for developing a cadre of advanced teachers. Napoleon also sponsored the creation of lycées, or high schools. Countries no in way. Europe and really around the globe imitated the French legal and educational systems as they strove to become modern as well. Yeah. And I know this may not seem like a huge deal, but it consider does. how different the world becomes as more people have access to education. That's crazy. Napoleon invented high school. <laughs> 1802. State schools of France in 1802. That's amazing. There are more potential innovators to solve big problems, and more people who can use the tool of writing to share their perspectives with wide audiences. That's huge. And more teachers to train and educate future generations yes. of professionals and experts. On the other hand, it's worth remembering that half of the population, women, oh, were right. denied not just most of the new opportunities in France, but also many of the rights they'd previously had. So Napoleon initially succeeded in France because he quelled the political chaos by making himself an emblem of authority and order right out of the dictator playbook. He also created a police state with strict censorship and spies mm. operating in everyday life. That's and he good. restored the monarchical systems of aristocratic titles and hierarchies, even giving back titles to some of the old aristocracy who could help revive the appearance of ceremonial grandeur. And so in all those ways, Napoleon was returning to Louis XIV's right. absolutism. So the revolution did turn all the way around, ending <laughs> where it started in that sense. While members of Napoleon's family often became wealthy and titled, his enemies were frequently exiled from France. The most famous of his exiled enemies was Germaine de Staël, the wealthiest woman in Europe and one of the most accomplished. De Staël never stopped criticizing the dictator, although at first she found him fascinating and even thought she might become his companion. Early on, she probed him for an expression of admiration of her talents by asking what kind of woman he valued the most, and he responded, the one with the most children, and pointedly gazed at her chest. After that, she denounced his brutal nature to whoever would listen, rallying opponents around her. Napoleon hated women. My gosh. Germaine de Stahl. Oh, her name was Anne-Louise Germaine de Stahl Holstein. She came onto Napoleon. And Napoleon's like, no, your boobs are not big enough. The only child of the Swiss governess Suzanne Kirchaud, and a prominent Swiss German banker. Probably had some money. But Napoleon didn't just have plans for France. He wanted to conquer and colonize all of Europe and the British Isles. He amassed a huge army by drafting young men between the ages of 20 and 24, then earned their complete devotion by fighting alongside them in at least 60 battles. That's As noble. he conquered German and Austrian territory, he brought men from those areas into his armies too. And That's by 1806, cool. he had ended the Holy Roman Empire after defeating Austria in several battles, most thoroughly at the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805. Then he went on to defeat Prussia in 1806 and Russia in 1807 after they declared war on France in succession. Napoleon then forced or inspired reforms in these new holdings, such as the end of serfdom, legislating religious toleration, wow. and creating schools to advance scientific and technological study. And he unified German states, excluding Austria, in the Confederation of the Rhine, and he imposed the Napoleonic Code and the metric system and other institutions for standardization that really helped to unify Europe. That's Amazing. What is the metric system? Stan says it's just something <laughs> Europeans do, like soccer and ensuring that all citizens have health care. One of the big effects of Napoleon's <laughs> European ambitions was that it inspired a lot of nationalism among his new subjects, who mostly opposed his dictatorial regimes. I mean, for one thing, most of these newly conquered lands were run by one of Napoleon's brothers who would serve as surrogate monarch. And if you're going to uh. live in a dictatorship, you want to at least be dictated by the dictator himself, not some brother. It's like going to see a matinee of a Broadway show and instead of getting the big star, you get some understudy. At any That's rate, this is so important bad. because people began to think of themselves as, for instance, German, in part because they didn't want to think of themselves as French. 
Napoleon's goal mm. was to colonize the entire continent, and he had mostly succeeded, but Spain was still unconquered and thwarting his continental system when, in 1807, Napoleon struck with an army of some 100,000 men. Wow. Spanish and Portuguese royals both left their capitals. Napoleon installed yet another brother, Joseph, as king, and resistance swelled with help from the British and Arthur Wellesley, who would later become the Duke of Wellington. And you can actually see how different communities responded to Napoleon differently in art, like Jacques-Louis de David painted triumphant moments in Napoleon's career, including his self-coronation as emperor, but Spanish painter Francisco Goya depicted Napoleonic rule as a reign of terror. Hmm. His 3rd of May 1808 right. shows a French firing squad mowing down peasants and clergy alike. Goya remained a chronicler of Spanish resistance and French barbarism as tens of thousands of French troops had to occupy the conquered kingdom because of Spanish hatred of the conquerors. Let's go to the thought bubble. Despite ongoing problems, Napoleon became determined to conquer and absorb all of Russia, especially since it had opted out of his continental system. He what? built an army. Okay, so he took over Spain with an army of 100,000, put his brother in charge, and that gave him the confidence to go after Russia, I guess. Russia's a lot bigger. Russia, they probably had a lot more people. The population of Spain in 1800 was approximately 14.7 million. Okay, how many in Russia? 25 million. 10 million more? That's a lot of people. He built an army of some 600,000 to 700,000 men from across his lands and began his invasion in June of 1812. Having trudged hundreds of miles, troops were exhausted and overcome by the heat, and the Russians refused to engage in battle. Instead, they retreated, practicing so-called scorched earth tactics by burning and destroying any resource, including oh. food and livestock, that could be of use to the invaders. Brilliant. Finally, at Borodino, the two sides engaged in what was ultimately a very costly victory for the French, who lost 30,000 men, while the Russians lost 45,000. But the French were thousands of miles from home territory, right. and so reinforcing and resupplying their army proved difficult. Foreign recruits, who were not as loyal to Napoleon, began melting away <laughs> as Hell winter yeah. approached and conditions worsened. The remaining 100,000-ish invaders marched on from Borodino, some 70 miles from Moscow, wow. but on reaching their destination, they found the city consumed by fire. Shelter and other necessities were once again in short supply. Still, Napoleon waited for Tsar Alexander I to surrender and agree to terms, but when that surrender failed to materialize, Napoleon led his depleted, starving, and frostbitten army westward to Poland. Many had died, many other soldiers had deserted, and more French troops would be killed by the Cossacks as they retreated. Only 40,000 of Napoleon's soldiers reached Poland alive <gasps> in 1813. Wow. So he started with hundreds of thousands, and he came back with 40,000. Who are the Cossacks? Semi-nomadic and semi-militarized people were allowed a great degree of self-governance in exchange for military service. So they didn't like Napoleon. So the European powers took note of the emperor's bedraggled forces and formed a coalition that included Russia, Austria, Prussia, and Sweden. And in 1813, their armies, backed by British financing, defeated French forces at Leipzig. This battle was waged because Napoleon refused to accept the Allies' terms, which would initially have allowed him to continue to rule France. But instead, in early 1814, he abdicated and headed for exile on Elba, an island in the Mediterranean. A year later, he escaped, returned to France, <laughs> gathered an army, and Hang confronted on. the... So, when Napoleon lost, they gave him some terms, and he didn't agree to them, and that's why he fell from power. So if he agreed to their terms, he could have stayed in power, maybe? I wonder what the terms were. The Treaty of Fontainebleau. The Allies granted him the island of Elba as a sovereign principality. An annual income of 2 million francs to be provided by France and a guard of 400 volunteers. Also, he retained the title of emperor? That sounds like a win to me. Oh, so I guess the terms were that he was to, set, to step down and his son was supposed to take over. And he didn't like that. That's what this is saying anyway. Okay, I don't want to read ahead of what the video is telling me. A year later, he escaped, returned to France, gathered an army, and confronted the powers <laughs> once him. more. 
finally surrendering on July 15, 1815, after being defeated at Waterloo. Napoleon was living in exile on the distant island of St. Helena when he died on May 5, 1821, 32 years to the day after the meeting of the Estates General that set the French Revolution into motion. Wow. Consider all that happened in those 32 years, and you'll understand why this period of French history is seen as so important to world history. Lots of Decades change. Decades after his death, Napoleon's remains were lavishly returned to France, placed in the Church of the Dome in the heart of Paris, and eventually re-encased in a grander sarcophagus under the church's golden dome itself. Why? Well, remember that under him, French achievements were massive in terms of education, commitment to science, standardization, modernization of the economy, and opening the door to opportunity for ordinary people. Mm. Well ordinary men. Right. French museums were packed with loot from across Europe and Egypt, plundered by Napoleon's armies. In fact, those museums are still packed with that loot. And there were all the unforgettable early military victories to look back to, as well as the revival of French cultural glory that led to the imitation of French things throughout the world. I mean, Muhammad Ali, the ruler of Egypt, who'd been part of the effort to drive Napoleon and his forces from the country, would begin programs in direct imitation of Napoleon's. And the creation of a true citizen's army, entranced by the heroism of its leader, also endured while his lightning attacks remained a model to future military innovators, and the Napoleonic Code was imitated worldwide. As Napoleon's body was re-entombed in splendor and pomp, one worker expressed France's general worship of the dictator, I've got the emperor in my guts. For better and for <laughs> worse, we still have Napoleon in our guts. Hmm. Thanks for watching. Wow, he did some really great stuff and some really horrible stuff. I feel like considering all the horrible things he did, they treated him really well. They didn't execute him. They let him live out the rest of his life and die of stomach cancer on an island in the Mediterranean. That sounds great. Two million francs a year for just chilling out and not attacking. But then he, he couldn't, he wasn't happy with that. He needed, to, he needed that power back. Wow, what a fascinating person. Well, thank you guys for recommending. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Later.